particularly thank all the legislatures who joined us after a very long day, or many days, fighting the good fight on behalf of all of us in, in, in New Hampshire. I think Andy Valensky is uh, on the call, and I'd like to welcome him. He, uh, he's going to be our keynote speaker on the second education forum, forum which we're going to do on March 11, uh, March 11th, rather. Um, Linda Tanner, who is a member of the House Education Committee and a leader of the committee to elect House Democrats, uh, is on the call tonight. Um, I think that uh, I saw Dave Doherty and Melanie Levake, who are close Kent Street friends, um, whose voices are sorely missed in this session, and we hope that they'll be back next time around. I know that uh, Wendy Thomas, who is, has signed up, I hope she's here or coming later, She's running a courageous race in the Hillsborough 21 special election, and she needs all the support from each and every one of you that you can offer. Volunteer, send money, do whatever you can to help Wendy out. We need her. Um, Senator Kahn is uh, working every day in the Senate to try and help uh, public education, and he's with us tonight. And of course, our own um, Hoppington Ward 5 representatives, Mary Jane and Mel and Dave Luno, um, have signed up and if not, not, are not on yet, probably will be soon. They've all been champions of public education for a very long time. And most importantly, thank all of you uh, grassroots leaders, uh, volunteers who are with us tonight. We've got lots of work to do um, in the coming months. Um, I would like, before we go any further, it's a, becoming something of a Kent Street tradition, but we would like to ask all of you to join together in a brief moment of silence to honor both the 470,000 Americans who have lost their lives to COVID and the 150 who were injured or died during the insurrection just over a month ago. Um, throughout this election cycle, uh, the Kent Street Coalition is going to be focusing on education and the potential effects of pending legislation on your property taxes. We think that this is an issue that we can use to our advantage uh, in the 2022 election. And we're gonna begin um, now working on that process. Uh, our next monthly meeting, which is on Thursday, March 11th, we'll, we'll focus um, on how we can effectively fight against the premise that state obligations can continually be downshifted the public education funding can be diverted to various schemes benefiting a small minority and property taxes can rise indefinitely. Our speakers will include Andy Valensky, uh, Karen Hicks of Civic Strategy, uh, the NEA's Brian Hawkins and Representative Tanner who will be speaking for the committee to elect House Dems. Um, additionally, uh, we are talking with Mel and Dave and others uh, on the possibility of adding a third session to focus on the uh, Education Commission report that the Republicans don't think matters and you all paid a great deal of money for. Um, and we wish they would consider, but to give them a form, an additional forum for them to talk about that. And secondly, we want to probably in that uh, forum, if, if we do it, um, we want to address the voucher calamity uh, that Sununu and Rick Ladd are dramming through the house as we speak um, or will be next week. So we'll keep you posted on that. I'd also like to mention that the Capital Coalition, our uh, coalition of seven towns around Concord, is in the beginning stages of developing a plan to provide resources to local grassroots and town committee leaders throughout the states. If we're looking at doing something with toolkits and Zoom issue form and forums, et cetera, so stay tuned for that possibility. However, begin tonight. Um, this is a uh, specifically non political and nonpartisan forum. Our objective will be to provide you with the factual understanding of the educational landscape in New Hampshire as we enter this year's legislative cycle. And our first. Um, Two speakers represent uh, nonprofit organizations and they seek to avoid political partnership. So we're fortunate to have the three very knowledgeable guests who have deep insight into the state budgetary process and its relationship to education funding and expenditure. They're Phil Sletton, Jeff McLynch, and Mike O'Brien. Phil is gonna uh, 
lay out the current budget challenges facing the legislature and the governor. Jeff McClinch is going to discuss how all this is paid for, and Mike is going to report a Sununu's budget speech today. I'll introduce each in turn um, after they uh, each in turn, and after they complete their uh, presentations, Louise and Mary Wilkie will lead us through your questions. So please put them in the chat uh, as, as we go along. Um, this uh, Zoom is being recorded. Recorded. So that's the end of my announcements. Um, Phil Sletton is the first up. He's the senior policy analyst at the New at, at New Hampshire Fiscal Policy Institute, which is an independent nonprofit research uh, organization here in Concord. He's worked with them since 2016. He researches New Hampshire budget and revenue policy, the economy and physical well-being of the state's residents, and health policy. Uh, Phil's a New Hampshire native. He pre previously worked as um, at the New Hampshire Office of Legislative Budget Assistant. So, Phil, we turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Rob. I appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for your time this evening. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hope that you are all able to see it. I hope everyone can. I'm not hearing yeah. anyone say no. So, all right, great. Um, so I want to walk you through um, some of the uh, some of the ways in which the New Hampshire state budget, you know, some of the some of the considerations that are being faced now, as well as how it interacts with education funding in particular. So we'll focus on that a little bit too. So uh, first, to get everyone up to speed, and I know there are people on this call who not only know this well but know it better than I do. Um, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, the uh, state budget in New Hampshire is a two-year or biennial operating budget. And it funds most, but not all, state operations for a two-year period. So, um, and they're based on state fiscal years. State fiscal years are from July 1st to June 30th. So the current operating budget is for state fiscal years 2020 and 2021. That period is July 1st, 2019 to June 30th of this year. Uh, the state budget, that the current state budget that's operating is uh, appropriated approximately $13 billion over those two years. Typically, when we talk about the size of a state budget, we're talking about um, those two combined dollar figures, although you can certainly divide it up into one year or another. And the state budget is also two bills, uh, typically called House Bill 1, which is the operating budget bill, and House Bill 2, which is the, the trailer bill. Uh, House Bill 1 um, is uh, typically what, what you might think of as a budget. It has line items and it has dollar appropriations beside each line item. House Bill 2, or the trailer bill, is, uh, is an omnibus text bill. Often it will have the text that sets up in statute the programs that may be funded through the state budget. It can have other items as well. So anything that is, uh, it, any topic can be covered uh, in the trailer bill, for example. And I should note, while they're typically House Bill 1 and House Bill 2, they do not have to be. Um, over the last two budget cycles, actually, the, the budgets have been renumbered over the course of the cycles uh, before being uh, signed into law. Uh, one thing that I, I noted earlier, not all expenditures are in the state budget. The state budget is not comprehensive, including all state expenditures. Uh, there, is, uh, there are separate documents, separate pieces of legislation that authorize um, spending, including the capital budget which covers a six year period and changes every two years. This is if a, if a state, if the state needs to um, rebuild the roof on a state building or install an elevator, for example, those are items that can be in the capital budget. The capital budget can also borrow money to balance. So a uh, bonding can be used to balance the budget. Whereas the uh, operating budget has to uh, balance, has to be a balanced revenue and expenditure plan. So revenues that come in during that time period will fund the operations. Uh, there's also uh, the 10-year transportation improvement plan, which is altered every two years, but is sort of a 10-year look at what projects are in the transportation queue. Um, and there are also separately authorized expenditures in other bills, including significant ones such as expanded Medicaid in the state, the Granted Advantage program, that's not funded through the state budget, it's authorized separately. Um, and federal funds uh, can be accepted later um, by the Joint Legislative Fiscal Committee. So funds that are in, either, either aren't in the budget or uh, arise from a federal grant that comes partway through a budget biennium, the Joint Legislative Fiscal Committee has authority to accept those. So uh, I mentioned that $13 billion figure, that's counting all of the state budget funds. 
Uh, and what are funds? Well, funds act sort of like accounts. Money comes in from various sources and goes out for various purposes. And these funds interact with one another in some instances. Uh, so you'll see on this pie chart, the blue slice is federal funds. It's about 30% of the state budget for state fiscal year 2021, just uh, this, this year's fiscal, uh, this year's state budget. Um, that 30% um, is probably actually a little bit lower than what it actually is, but it, I didn't, uh, in terms of uh, the expenditures that are funded through federal dollars, including those expenditures outside of the state budget. Um, so, but these, these uh, programs, these federal programs will provide funding usually for specific purposes. Uh, the federal funds are generally tied to a specific program such as, um, such as Medicaid or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program where all the benefits are uh, federally funded. Um, the funds also act like accounts, uh, pardon me, the funds also, because they interact with one another, um, you'll see general fund dollars are, are more flexible. So that next largest slice, that green slice, is, uh, is the general fund and um, dollars that flow into that generally come from state tax revenue sources or their state generated sources. So policymakers have the more flexibility to move money from, for example, the general fund to other accounts if they need to, um, or to other funds, uh, or they, um, they can deploy them as general funds in different parts of the state budget from budget cycle to budget cycle with a relatively high degree of flexibility. Now, um, the, uh, the general fund does have an obligation to fill any shortfall in the education trust fund, which is that orange slice that you see here. And the education trust fund is where the adequate education grants are funded from. Uh, those adequate education grants that go to local public school districts. So if the education trust fund does have a shortfall, the general fund does fill in that gap. Um, other very important funds include the highway funds, the turnpike funds, uh, and, uh, and the other fund slices more than 200 other smaller funds, again, for specific purposes. Um, I'll note that a lot of these funds are set up in statute, but some are the result of constitutional requirements. So for example, lottery revenues are dedicated to um, education aid by the New Hampshire state constitution. Now, I mentioned those uh, adequate education grants for local public schools. Um, it, just in case you aren't aware of how they're structured, they are per pupil grants that are provided um, generally based on characteristics in a municipality, but do go to school districts to fund local public education. So the base amount for a student in a school district in state fiscal year 2020 was a little more than $3,700. Um, that base amount did, there are additions onto that base amount for a certain characteristics. So if a student may uh, be a special education uh, recipient, uh, aid recipient, um, uh, they may be a free and reduced price school meal eligible student, which generally means they're from, a, that means they're from a family who has low incomes or has a low income. Um, they could be an English language learner student. These are all additions on top of that base amount that are based on those student characteristics. Um, if, you, if you're a student and you aren't eligible for all of those, uh, but you scored below proficient on your third grade reading tests, that is another way in which there could be additional dollars that then go to the school district uh, for, to fund education for that student. Now, you'll notice uh, all the way over on the right, uh, you can see the bar that shows the actual average costs that schools uh, face in terms of their average spending per student. I'm um, divided up in a couple different ways, but so depending on what you include, um, the average operating expenses per pupil in the uh, last school year was uh, between almost 17,000 and almost $20,000. Now, the funding, for the general and education trust funds together comes from a pretty wide variety of sources. And this is the, these are the sets of sources that policymakers, when they're thinking about general, uh, general education trust fund dollars available, this is the set of sources they're generally thinking about. Um, and you'll notice it's a pretty diverse revenue picture. There aren't any sort, there are only four sources on here that are larger than 10%. Um, and one of them, the statewide education property tax, the state doesn't actually collect, it's raised and retained locally, but it offsets state liabilities. Um, that's not to say that the uh, smaller revenue sources are insignificant. Uh, the you know, liquor commission, insurance premium tax, interest and dividends tax, we're talking about one in $20 that are, uh, that are contributing to the uh, general and education trust funds. Um, but uh, you'll see that I've also shaded together the two business taxes 
The business profits and the business enterprise tax are actually relatively different tax revenue sources, uh, but they are filed together typically. They are also analyzed together often, and they're not split out uh, until all the returns are in, which can be a significant ways down the road. So you'll see them, um, you'll see them often analyzed together and treated as one in terms of the revenue stream, even though they're two very different tax revenue sources. Now, how have re uh, revenues to the general and education trust funds trended over time? So you'll see that it's actually been a pretty interesting picture, particularly how they've fared through the COVID-19 crisis. Um, this is a graph that goes back to 2013, um, and this provides with a little bit of context for what we've seen recently. Uh, in the middle of the last decade, there was a period where there was um, sort of faster economic growth following a slow period of growth in the recovery from the Great Recession. And that led to some revenue surpluses actually at the state level. Um, after the uh, passage in December 2017 at the federal level of the uh, federal tax overhaul, uh, that encouraged repatriation of business profits from overseas. Some of those were then um, uh, captured by the business profits tax base and added significantly to uh, the revenues in the state of New Hampshire. We saw those revenues drop off and really that downward spike that you see, uh, that the nadir of the revenues is was in um, the first half of 2020, where there was a significant drop associated with the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. However, since then, and thus far in state fiscal year 2021, we've seen a pretty significant rebound, which is not what a lot of folks expected back in May and June of last year. Um, indeed, the rebound has been significant enough that if you look at the revenue collected over the course of the biennium thus far, relative to that zero dollar line, which was the uh, planned revenue in the state budget, um, you can see that cumulatively, the revenues are actually getting back closer to uh, where the budget would be balanced. Again, these are unaudited cash revenues, and we still have about half of the revenue for this state fiscal year outstanding. So this picture could certainly change, but it's a much more favorable revenue environment than we thought that we would be in um, back in the middle of calendar year 2020. And if there is a small shortfall um, or even a significant one, there is a mechanism in state law um, and a, a, a way to uh, offset those losses that's called the rainy day fund or formally the revenue stabilization reserve account, uh, which is part of the general fund. And uh, this really was designed in statute to provide a, um, a way to capture surplus at the end of a budget biennium uh, and then deploy uh, dollars when there was a revenue shortfall at the end of a budget biennium. And you can see here that, um, that policymakers did use the, the uh, rainy day fund to deploy resources to support the state budget when the Great Recession struck. So between 2008 and 2009, you can see while the rainy day fund had been building up, uh, it dropped back down because policymakers deployed uh, the rainy day fund uh, resources to support the state budget. Now, uh, since then, and again, in the second half of the recovery from the Great Recession, where um, both revenues and the state economy has picked up a little bit more, uh, we can see that uh, the uh, rainy day fund has gone to about $116 million, which is where it is today. So that is something that could offset a revenue shortfall. Um, but what's important to remember is even if revenues recover entirely to where they were planned to be for the current state budget, um, there's still uh, there's still maybe some challenge in terms of funding the current state budget levels in the next state budget because the current the current state budget had the benefit of a significant surplus from the prior state budget, and policymakers did deploy that in the current state budget to fund services. Um, so this coming state budget will likely not have the benefit of that significant of a surplus, even if it is closer to balance, then it's still likely to be a little bit of a shortfall. Um, here you can see in green the surplus that's carried forward from each prior year, and in orange the same year revenues minus expenditures, so what was just happening in that year regardless of what surplus was being carried forward. And you can see that going into state fiscal year 2020, there was a more than $200 million revenue surplus that was carried forward um, into the next state budget from the prior state budget. And that funded some key services, um, but it does mean that the revenues would have to, uh, to, be, um, to do more than recover to uh, support the same services in the next budget biennium. And some of those services that were supported here uh, by, by those surplus revenues and other revenues collected during the biennium 
um, included assistance to uh, local governments. Um, that includes both education aid and municipal aid. So uh, when it comes to education, uh, in the current state budget in total, there was an additional roughly $139 million that was added in, the, in adequate education aid, so distributed in part through those adequate education grants um, in the current state budget relative to policy that was in place in the prior state budget. Um, so that's a pretty significant increase. Um, some parts of it were written into the statute as continuing policy. So there was an increase in what's called stabilization grants. Um, that was about a $57 million increase. Stabilization grants uh, exist as a result of the uh, prior, uh, most uh, substantial rewrite, if you will, of the uh, state's adequate education funding formula. So how those adequate education grants are built. The stabilization grants were designed to ensure that there weren't uh, communities that received uh, less funding uh, in the subsequent year, or at least significantly less funding. And uh, the stabilization grants have declined over time. Uh, this, um, uh, this current state budget restores them to their original amounts and, the, and does envision, uh, based on the way the statute is written, continuing that restoration of those stabilization grants. And there's also a full day kindergarten uh, uh, provision in the current state budget. Uh, the kindergarten, kindergarten used to be funded at sort of half levels, if you will, is half the education, adequate education grant that a student in grades one through 12, um, uh, their school district would receive. Um, even if the student did have full day kindergarten, they would still receive that half amount um, in the current budget is established to be a full, um, a full amount of an adequate education grant for full day kindergarten students. But there is also um, in the current state budget one-time aid, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, the one, uh, the one-time aid um, came in two forms, and uh, one was more resources that were devoted to uh, uh, students from municipalities um, that are going to school districts because the school districts do end up with the dollars uh, eventually. Um, but the, the the calculations are based on the municipalities. So students from these communities that have lower equalized valuations per pupil. So that's another way of saying taxable property wealth per student. Um, and that amount totaled $50 million. So students where there was a, a smaller property tax base per student, that amount totaled $50 million in additional aid targeted at those communities. There were also uh, communities that uh, have higher concentrations of free and reduced price school meal eligible students. Again, these are students um, from low income families. Uh, that was an additional $12.5 million, again, estimated at the time. Um, so that's additional aid targeted at those, uh, at those communities where there's a higher concentration of, um, of students from low income families. There was also additional school building aid and uh, what, uh, what's called here non-formula special education aid, which is not education aid that's in the education funding formula, but separate edu uh, special education aid um, for, um, for, for certain scenarios. There was also municipal aid, so aid not to school districts, but um, directly to municipal governments. That included $40 million in unrestricted, again, identified as one-time aid um, during the biennium that went to municipalities. And there was also additional aid added for environmental grants and for law enforcement at the local level as well. So just to hone in on those two forms of one-time education aid, um, the current budget, again, directs more dollars to more uh, to school districts that have more low income students, a higher percentage of low income students. So here you can see across the bottom, the percentage increase, the percentage of students that are eligible for free and reduced price school meals. So they're close to or below the poverty level in terms of their family income. And you can see that the aid shown in blue increased on a sliding scale between two points. Um, on a sliding scale for those communities that had higher concentrations, a higher percentage of students who are free and reduced price school meal eligible. Um, so the amount of aid increased as the concentration increased. Um, and you can see that it did a level off eventually um, at additional $350 per eligible student. The green dots show you where, uh, how many students were uh, uh, in each of those communities. And uh, the other form of targeted aid, again, this one time, this aid that's identified as one time in the current state budget for this uh, state fiscal year in particular, um, was targeted at uh, communities with lower relative property wealth. Uh, so again, this is a smaller amount of dollars available in the tax in the tax base per student. And here you can see the lower the equalized valuation per pupil, the higher the additional amount of aid per student 
with a sliding scale going down to, um, this was estimated to cover approximately 51% of all students. And you can see the students shown in the green bar distribution. There are also 13% of students that lived in municipalities that are beyond the edge of this graph in terms of uh, more than $1.5 million in taxable property wealth per student. So these are all, um, these were all identified as items that um, were funded in the current state budget. These last two were uh, ones that were um, in, in envisioned by the way the statute was written as being potentially one time only for state fiscal year 2021. Um, the revenue required for them was again that about $62.5 million. Uh, but, uh, and that additional revenue could come again in the next budget, but there are proposals to reduce revenue uh, to the state budget as well. Um, there's a, a couple of different separate pieces of legislation. Um, one piece would lower the business profits and the business enterprise tax rates. Um, the business profit tax rate would go down to 7.5% and the business enterprise tax would go down to 0.5% in, a, two, in a, a, a stepped fashion over the next two years. Um, that, uh, that, it's uncertain exactly what that impact will be, but it's uh, estimated to be about a um, $78 million reduction during the next budget biennium and even have some impact before that, so an additional $6 million on top of that. Um, there's also a proposal that would uh, eliminate the interest and dividends tax over time, uh, raising the thresholds between now and then, the, uh, the required filing thresholds. Because it's raising the thresholds, the estimated revenue reduction during the biennium is actually only about $15 million. It's still a significant amount of money, but is um, far, uh, far less significant than when the tax is repealed um, under this proposal. And at the end of five years, uh, the, in state fiscal year 2020, the interest and dividends tax generated about $126 million in revenue. Um, there's also a proposal um, that's in the state budget uh, as proposed by the governor to uh, change the meals and rentals tax rate from 9% to 8.5%. So obviously there's uh, just quite a bit of discussion of the economy and ways to um, stimulate the economy in New Hampshire. And uh, there is some uh, research and evidence that um, that's available, especially looking at federal level policies as this, as the research behind this table does um, that tries to evaluate how effective is each public policy in terms of stimulating the economy, in terms of spurring economic growth. And here we can see, and this is research from Moody's Analytics that was done based on the, um, based on uh, close to the low point of the Great Recession, so early in 2009. Um, what is, what economic effect does an additional dollar of, uh, of, bene of investment from a certain policy produce in the economy? And here we can see that a temporary increase in food assistance, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, generated $1.74 of economic activity for every dollar invested based on these estimates. Um, and then uh, uh, additionally, unemployment benefits, infrastructure spending, um, again, these are federal programs, so aid to state governments, providing state governments with more resources, also had a, a positive effect, right? More than a dollar of economic growth generated per dollar invested. Um, if you look at the other end of the table, you can see that um, they, again, this was a federal policy change making permanent existing reductions in dividends and capital gains taxes. Um, so there were existing reductions if they had been made permanent, that would have generated 39 cents for each dollar uh, uh, um, uh, invested based on these estimates and a permanent reduction in the corporate tax rate would have produced 32 cents. Um, so these are important when we're thinking about policies that can benefit the economy in New Hampshire. Um, in particular, uh, there's, uh, there's been a pretty severe impact. The most severe impacts of the COVID-19 crisis have been on households with lower incomes and with more limited means. And we see in survey data of New Hampshire adults that there are still many households that are having trouble meeting their expenses. So these survey data are from uh, early and mid-January from the U.S. Census Bureau. And uh, it shows that about uh, a little bit more than a quarter of adults indicated it was somewhat or very difficult to pay for usual household expenses in the previous seven days. So those are likely the, ho the households that have seen uh, jobs disappear, more low income workers have seen their jobs disappear, and, um, uh, and that uh, these, these households are maybe are the ones who came into the recession the least prepared to weather the COVID-19 crisis. Um, now, an important consideration is uh, what to, um, what happens then on the on the tax policy side? Who does that affect? Well, if we think about where the interest and dividends tax base is, 
um, then we can, you know, get a sense of uh, of what the incomes are of the individuals and, in some cases, entities paying these taxes. Um, so the interest and dividends tax, for example, um, uh, close to half of the tax revenue paid in tax year 2018, um, which was the most recent year for which we have these detailed data, uh, was from uh, either individual or joint filers or fiduciaries um, that generated more than $200,000 in interest and dividend income. Um, so this is not including wage and salary income. This isn't including capital gains. This is just taxable interest and dividend income. About half the revenue came from um, those who were uh, had more than $200,000 in tax year 2018 from those assets that were generating interest, dividends, and distributions. So um, some takeaways uh, from this short presentation, a pretty a short run through of some of the issues that we're facing, uh, that the state's facing in the current state budget uh, uh, discussions. Um, the budget shortfall is smaller than we was anticipated early in the early days of the uh, pandemic, and it may even be balanced by the end, uh, depending on how revenues behave over the next several months. Um, however, the, the there's significant reliance in the current state budget on past surplus, and the needs in the next budget biennium are likely to be higher, especially early on during the budget biennium. And if they are higher, then deficits that are you, that are generated in meeting those needs earlier can be offset later with revenue and spending adjustments as long as the budget plan balances by June of 2023. There are also certain policies such as aid to individuals um, and supporting public services that appear to be more effective economic stimulus than other policies. And a significant amount of the education aid passed in the current state budget is ongoing, while others were designed to be one time in the current state budget. Um, and there's also th that additional assistance in the current state budget to, uh, has been focused on communities with many low income students and uh, less relative property tax value or property wealth um, that can be taxable. Um, so that's an important consideration when we think about the current economic situation. Um, there are proposals out there that would reduce revenue that would likely limit the ability of the state to fund these services and fund assistance to local governments. And again, the recession has impacted those with the fewest resources most severely, and policy can help build an equitable, inclusive, and sustainable uh, recovery. So I want to provide you with a couple additional resources. Um, you can find these on our website at nhfpi.org. Um, and again, I'll be happy to um, share this slide deck as well. This slide deck will be on our website. Um, you could see an issue brief uh, that we released actually this week, um, designing a state budget to meet New Hampshire's needs during and after the COVID-19 crisis, as well as a presentation that uh, provides some economic context for where we are now. So with that, I'd be happy to hand it back to Rob. Um, and you can see our contact information here as well. Um, do, Feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Phil. I will. Um, I will. I hope I can. Uh, that that's really helpful. And for those of you who have only been able to memorize, say, seventy-five percent of that, uh, we will try and uh, I'll try and work with Phil to get that posted along with the recording um, to everybody that signed up for the chat. Um, and I, we can probably get that done by Saturday. Um, if they, is that all right with you, Phil, to, to yes. for, me, for us to send that out to the people that signed up? Yes, absolutely. So I will, um, and the link for this uh, presentation on our website will be on tomorrow. So I'll make sure that it's okay. there and available. And I'll, I'll provide the link to you, Rob, if that's the best way to do it. Okay, great. That, that, that's terrific. Um, okay, so if everybody can take five seconds to stretch and, and relax a little bit. Um, Jeff McClinch is our next speaker. He's the uh, project director for the New Hampshire School Funding Fairness Project. That's a nonprofit organization that seeks to educate citizens and policymakers about the system New Hampshire uses to fund its public schools and to advocate for changes in law to make that system more fair for students and taxpayers alike. Uh, among his prior positions, Jeff was the director of the Massachusetts Coalition for Adult Education the executive director of the New Hampshire Fiscal Policy Institute, where Phil works now, um, the state policy director at the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, and the member of the professional staff of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Jeff join us and take it away. Jeff, do you have slides and do you have- uh, I do have slides. Uh, are you are you able to share your screen? Let me uh, give it a go here. How's that? Can everyone see that? There you go. Good. Excellent. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Rob. And thank you all, uh, Louise, Rob, and Mary, and everyone else at Kent Street for giving me a chance to speak with you all tonight. Oh. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'll offer a similar disclaimer to Phil that uh, while some of you may be coming to this topic for the first time, there are at least several people on this call who are far more knowledgeable about this subject than I. So I proceed with a little bit of trepidation, but you know they can always, I'm sure they'll chime in uh, during the conversation uh, portion of the event. So tonight's, um, one of the themes for our conversation tonight is education and taxation. And it's really um, hard to talk about that subject without talking straight away about property taxes, since that is the single largest source of funding for public schools in New Hampshire, as this uh, graph here shows. For the 2019-2020 school year, um, the total amount of revenue flowing into those school districts was just shy of $3.4 billion. Um, local property taxes in the form of locally levied uh, rates, as well as the um, what's called the statewide property tax, accounted for 73% or 73 cents out of every dollar uh, that they received and then spent. Um, as Phil touched on earlier, there's uh, obviously other sources like state adequacy aid uh, with, and the lottery and other forms of state aid. But the overwhelming uh, portion of those funds, again, come from local property taxes. Um, and so not only does it play an outsized role in school funding, but property taxes play an outsized role in New Hampshire's tax system as a whole, as it's the single largest source of revenue um, within state and local um, circles. You know, you see here local school taxes are uh, just over $2 billion for 2019. Municipal taxes are a little bit uh, more than $1.1 billion. Those dwarf um, the state sources of revenue like the business and profits tax and the business enterprise tax, as well as any other uh, state revenue source. And you know, to add to that, not only um, does the property tax play an obviously outsized role in funding local schools, but our reliance on it has only grown over time and continues to grow. If you look back over the last decade or so and look at how that revenue has grown, that pie chart uh, may have expanded that I showed you, it's almost all come from growth in local uh, property taxes to the tune of over $500 million or half a billion dollars, um, well in excess of any growth in state adequacy aid or federal funds uh, or other state aid. Now, this you know, sort of outsized reliance on property taxes might not be such a uh, pressing problem if all property was evenly distributed across cities and towns in New Hampshire and all the kids uh, that lived here uh, were done in the same fashion. But um, I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear that that is not the case uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, there's wide disparities among cities and towns in their level of property wealth, as this table here tries to illust illustrate. Uh, right in the center is the state as a whole um, and all up uh, for 2019-2020. Um, our public schools were serving about 173,000 kids and property values um, that were used in turn to fund uh, services for them exceeded uh, $207 billion that year. That works out to an equalized value per pupil of just about $1.2 million. An equalized value per pupil, as Phil touched on a little bit, is just a way of measuring the taxable resources that are available to serve uh, kids in a, in a given area or a given community. Um, and it, again, as this table illustrates, there's a wide dispersion of property values throughout the state. You know, if you think about a place like Moultonboro, um, they only had about 450 kids uh, that they were trying to educate um, in the 2019-2020 school year, but their property values um, were over $3.6 billion. And so on a per pupil basis, that's close to $8 million uh, per kid. Um, think about a community at the other end of the spectrum like Newport, um, they were serving 800 kids with uh, about $477 million worth of um, equalized value or um, just under $600,000 per pupil. So nearly, you know, greater than uh, or more than one-tenth of the value of Moultonboro. And that has a predictable effect on the property tax rates that are needed to generate funds for education. Moultonboro was able to generate $28,000 $28, per kid um, in this school year with a rate of just 3.6 um, dollars per thousand of value. Newport, on the other hand, had a user rate of four times that amount to generate one third 
or roughly one third of the resources um, to serve their kids. So obviously immense disparities among districts um, with, with outcomes on their ability to serve their kids. You know, one way to sort of wrap your head around this is to look at different communities and different um, properties in those communities and think about the property tax bills that they might pay. So on the left-hand side here, we have a very nice home, uh, historic home, over 300 years old, uh, got a great view of the Great Bay, um, you know, and all the bells and whistles. And on the right, we have a much more modest home, an older mobile home, two bedrooms, um, has a detached garage. And you might think, well, yeah, clearly the house on the left is going to have higher property taxes. Well, because of where these two places are located, um, it's actually the house on the right that has a slightly higher property tax bill for school purposes in 2019. Uh, because the home on the left is located in Newington, which has um, exceptionally high property values overall, they can use much lower rates to generate funds for schools. In Charlestown, that's not the case. Um, property values are much lower there. As a result, they have to rely on much higher rates to generate revenue. And as a result, individual homeowners uh, face bills that you know are equal to that paid by uh, much more affluent folks in other parts of the state. So, what you know, as I touched on, just as property values are not equally distributed, the kids that public schools are serving are not equally distributed as well. And um, as a result, you end up with a situation in which the vast majority of kids in the state are schooled in areas where where property values are below average. Um, and you know this this has a number of consequences, but one of the positive ones is that um, there, if you look at sort of the variety of towns here, there are uh, towns served by Democrats in the legislature, towns served by Republican in the legislature that are to the left of that bar in the vast majority of students. And so there are opportunities for coalitions in the future uh, going forward. So um, as we sort of transition to think about sort of state resources, a good sort of interlude is the SWEP, since while it's got the word state in its name, it's very much a local tax. And the way that this tax works now is somewhat different than when it was originally conceived, but it is intended to generate a set amount of $363 million that municipalities now collect, uh, but don't actually end up sending to the state. They just use it um, to um, pay for um, a portion of adequacy uh, the cost of a constitutionally adequate education. No, the rate right easy. now, the rate right now is something before view options. The rate right now is just about $2 uh, per thousand. But back when the tax first um, was instituted, rather than um, generating a set amount of money, it used a set rate of 6.6 6, uh, mills or six, $6.66, $6.60 per thousand. And therefore, if we had the same rate, it would generate much more resources now. Um, and because of those changes, SWEPT is a far uh, larger share, or excuse me, far, far smaller share of overall property taxes um, in the state. Um, again, that's due in large measure to that change in, in how the uh, tax is levied over time. So um, why do we rely so heavily on uh, local property taxes to fund schools? Well, that's because New Hampshire contributes less to its public schools than any other state in the nation. Th this right here arrays all 50 states um, in the union and looks at the share that state dollars provide to local schools. Uh, on the far right, uh, this might be the only time we ever say this, is our neighbor Vermont. Um, they provide well over 80% of local um, district revenue uh, from state sources on the far left. Um, is the Granite State. And we only get up above 30% if you include SWEPT in those calculations. It's actually a lot closer to 20% because the SWEPT, again, is really a, a local tax with a statewide name attached to it. Um, so turning to focus on uh, state sources, as Phil touched on earlier, um, this looks here at the Education Trust Fund only. And like Phil's earlier pie chart, it's pretty diffuse there are a variety of sources that go into the Education Trust Fund, uh, a portion of the BET, the Business Enterprise Tax, and a portion of the BPT fund it, a portion of the Meals and Rooms Tax uh, does as well. Uh, so next time you're in a car, those dollars are going to uh, schools. 
Um, you also have the lottery, uh, which we touched on earlier, um, and it's a pretty wide ranging sources of revenue. Um, as we sort of think a little bit more about issues at the state level, I do wanna highlight, um, and I'm sure Mike will talk a little bit about this um, in his presentation about the governor's budget, but we are facing a situation now in which state education aid is expected to decline by $90 million in the coming year. And there are really four sources to that decline. Uh, Phil touched on two of them already, the expiration of two uh, forms of aid that were included in the current budget, uh, fiscal disparity aid and additional assistance. But the pandemic is also likely going to have an impact um, in that it is temporarily suppressing the counts that are used to determine state aid for both students generally and for low-income students. For students generally, um, we're seeing attendance declines uh, for, for a variety of reasons. You know, parents may be choosing to um, educate their kids themselves uh, in the face of uncertainty about uh, remote or hybrid learning. They may be uh, pursuing um, private school options, but there's also every likelihood that there are just simply kids whose parents are working full time um, and therefore are not able to sort of monitor their kids' educational activities at home who are simply choosing not to attend school and are just falling through the cracks. Um, also on the free and reduced price lump side of things, um, really the problem stems um, from a positive step the federal government took to extend food assistance to all students and make it easier to acquire that during the pandemic. That has the unfortunate effect of reducing the number of people who are providing the paperwork to their local schools to indicate whether they're eligible for free and reduced price lunch. Um, that's important because those numbers are in turn used to decide a uh, portion of the state aid. The, the main thing to know is that those numbers, both sets of those numbers for uh, attendance generally and for free and reduced price lunch are likely to rebound this fall when schools return to a much closer to normal situation of full-time in-person learning. But because of the time lag that's built into the ed funding formula um, without changes in law, um, even as those kids are coming back, schools will see uh, their resources decline. And so all told from these four sources, we're likely to see a $90 million drop uh, in the absence of legislative action in the coming year. Phil went into um, some pretty um, good detail about additional aid and fiscal capacity disparity aid. So I don't wanna belabor the point, but I do wanna um, emphasize that while, um, while these two forms of aid were portrayed as temporary uh, in the course of the most recent budget negotiations, these are two steps forward that the state um, really should take to help mitigate long-term disparities in education funding. And we certainly talked about fiscal capacity disparities. Um, certainly there are disparities in um, the students that are being served. So while it may be portrayed as temporary, um, all the inequities that these two um, forms of aid are intended to help address are going to be just as severe in the next two years as they were in the past two years. So there's every reason for the legislature to continue forward uh, in providing this type of aid. Um, and there are several options on the table now for addressing some of these problems. Um, in particular, um, two bills I wanna highlight, um, House Bill 623, um, and I don't know if Representative Luno is still on the call, but um, that bill was heard in uh, House Finance last week and will be exec in House Finance next week. So if you have a uh, member of um, your state house delegation who serves on House Finance, please be sure to call them to let them know your views about House Bill 623. Uh, on the Senate side, SB 135 was approved by Senate Finance this past week and will go to the Senate floor next week. Um, that bill, um, while it takes some positive steps, really only does half the job. It um, addresses the sources of decline related to the pandemic, but doesn't extend uh, fiscal capacity disparity aid or additional aid um, in the way that um, House Bill 623 would. The two other bills here, uh, House Bill 608 and Senate Bill 145, um, are also intended to provide um, you know, some short-term changes to um, address these possible declines. And there's another bill here, Senator Kahn's bill, uh, I believe it's 158, uh, that's not included here that uh, would make some longer term changes consistent with the recommendations of the school funding, um, Commission to Study School Funding. The 
the thing I want to emphasize about this possible decline in aid is that uh, we're likely to see just sort of another repeat of history in which the state uh, fails to make good on its commitments and forces local communities to make up the difference. And um, given the, the particulars of these forms of aid and also the particulars of uh, the property values in these towns, the um, likely property tax increases that could result from the failure to act and to failure to, to stem that $90 million decline could be felt hardest in uh, property poor communities. So for instance, uh, we looked at this and if communities were to choose to address the shortfall that's going to uh, that could occur uh, strictly through property tax increases, there are over 20 communities in the state uh, in which the rate increase would need to be more than two um, dollars per thousand. And obviously, they're concentrated in areas like Troy, as you see here, that have very low property values. Uh, those places with comparatively high values would need very low to no rate increases to compensate for that. And just to put it into sort of, you know, what it might mean for individual property tax bills, we've got a few examples here of some pretty hard hit communities. Um, and for somebody who owns a $200,000 home, if they live in Troy, that possible um, property tax increase could be as high as $920. Again, this is in a scenario in which the town of Troy chooses to close that gap strictly through property tax uh, increases. If they choose to make other undesirable choices like cutting uh, school funding, obviously the rate increase wouldn't need to be as large, um, but this just gives you a sense of the scale involved. Um, and most of these folks, most of these towns are concentrated in the north and western part of the state. And just to give you an idea a little bit further about the geography, we've listed some of the Senate districts uh, here. Um, I do want to Talk a, since we're talking about taxes and property taxes and school funding, I did want to uh, touch on two other areas that are going to be before the legislature this year um, in which there is a possibility of making progress in the near term. Uh, some two, two very valuable long term principles articulated by that commission to study school funding. The first is um, restoring the statewide property tax as a true statewide tax. One of the things I left out in my earlier discussion about the SWEPT is that right now there are a couple dozen communities who, because they have comparatively high property values, generate much more in SWEP than they actually need to meet the cost of an adequate education. And due to changes in law enacted about a decade ago, are allowed to keep that excess. Um, if they were to be required to return that to the state, because this is a statewide tax intended to fulfill a statewide obligation, that would generate about 25 to $30 million annually. And the commission to um, study school funding looked at this at some length. And you know, in their final report, they argued that the state should eliminate these excess SWEP grants and, um, and eliminate any kind of blanket rebates or abatements or refunds or, of grants of SWEP back to municipalities. The second principle that the commission articulated um, was to ensure that uh, we enhance taxpayer equity through greater property tax relief uh, targeted to homeowners and renters. And right now, there is a program that's designed to accomplish that goal, but it's all but, but evaporated um, over the past 15 years or so. That program, which has the really lengthy name of the Low and Moderate Income Homeowners Property Tax Relief Program, um, used to pay out uh, close to or about seven and a half million dollars on an annual basis and serve about 27,000 homeowners. That's dwindled to the point now where it's just $1.1 million and only 7,000 homeowners. There's legislation, House Bill 504, which will also be heard in Ways and Means next week, that would um, act on both of these principles, would restore the SWEPT as a true statewide tax and significantly expand that property tax relief program, not only um, increasing the number of people who could benefit from it, but uh, also increasing the value of the rebates that it pays out. There's a similar bill, House Bill 486. Um, I'm not quite sure sort of the status of that bill that um, would also expand the program, but just not to the same uh, degree. So I do wanna just wrap up there. I know Mike uh, has got a lot to say about uh, the governor's budget and we're happy to chime in there as well. Um, but again, uh, we're with the New Hampshire School Funding Fairness Project listed all of our uh, contact information here. Uh, my direct email address is jmcclinch at fairfundingnh.org. 
Um, our general address is info at fairfundingnh.org. And if uh, you're so inclined um, and you enjoy doom scrolling, you can follow us on Twitter um, or uh, Facebook or Instagram is more your bent. We've got our um, handles there. And then there's always the good old fashioned phone. So uh, thanks so much for your time tonight and uh, listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions folks might have uh, when we get to that point. Hey, thank you so much. That's great. And uh, everybody, we will uh, also post uh, Jeff's um, uh, slides uh, over the weekend when we sort that all out and how, how to do that. Um, so next up is our buddy, Mike O'Brien, who's been a friend of Kent Street and worked closely with a lot of us over the years. Um, he's currently the Governor, Governor Affairs Advisor, a Government Affairs Advisor for Pretty Strategies. Um, he works with the American Federation of Teachers, New Hampshire, on education issues. Prior to joining Preddy, Mike was a communications and policy director for Steve Shirtliff. And before that, he uh, worked with America Votes uh, for almost a decade on elections and voting rights. So Mike is going to give us at least a two-hour presentation on <laughs> the governor's five-minute speech today talking about education. You're, you're on, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Everybody, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, I, you know, I'll just say this: I, you know, everything I learned about the budget, I learned from working with Mary Jane the previous two years. So anything I know and get right on this is because of her, and everything I get wrong, she's everything she could. Um, but um, I, I want to just say, to start here and say, you know, this is obviously very new, right? So uh, we got uh, a very, very top line um, sort of presentation from the governor today. HB one is out. Um, as Phil said, that first bill is just numbers. HB2 are the words that back up what those numbers really do. You can really dive through HB1 and figure out where they all match up um, and do that, but it is much easier to see once the trailer bill comes out. So what do we know from what the governor talked about today? Um, first and foremost, get ready for tax cuts. Just lots of tax cuts. Um, business enterprise tax, uh, the rooms and meals tax. Uh, next time you go out and order a $10 sandwich, you'll save a nickel. So hope everyone stores those in your pockets. Um, and he says on top of that, we won't see property tax increases. But what we also know from his budget, as Jeff pointed out, is you're looking at at least a $90 million hole, almost $100 million hole in education from where we were a year ago. That last year, in the budget process was a focus um, to get that $138 million in education funding, $40 million in municipal aid um, back to communities. That was a, a big, big budget focus. And that is gone this year. It's not a surprise, frankly, that it's not there, um, but it is gone this year. So um, that combined with the prospect of uh, House Bill 20, which is the um, voucher program, uh, what they call the Education and Freedom Accounts Bill, um, will blow an even bigger hole in education upwards of almost $200 million uh, by the time this could all be said and done um, in, this, in this first year of the next biennium. So um, this is, you know, a, obviously a big blow to supporters of public education, a big blow to folks who care about property taxes. Um, as a whole, the budget's going to do, a, you know, a lot of, it's a huge document, will do a lot of different things. Um, this is, a, interestingly, uh, on, on total, the budget's about 5% higher in total spending, but it's about $400 million lower in money that comes from the general and education trust funds. So um, most of when you see that we're gonna spend more, most of that is federal matches, uh, which New Hampshire's budget lives off of, um, is the federal matches. And that's where we're gonna see this, you know, why it's gonna spend more when in reality we're, we're pulling less from those, from those two funds. Uh, the governor talked about a voluntary family leave program being in his budget. So we should expect to hear a lot about that. Um, you know, folks who have studied this issue and looked at it know that the voluntary leave program is not going to work, um, but that is what he will trumpet inside of his budget. Um, and then he spent a couple, I'm gonna make this real quick because I want folks to have questions and because really he gave a really, he was very much the governor today, folks. He gave a very flashy speech without a ton of substance behind it. So it's gonna take some time to dig into all this. Um, but two things, uh, one talked about combining the um, university system, both the community college system and the University of New Hampshire system into one. Um, unclear what that does really, but 
he seemed super jazzed about it. Um, and then the second thing, uh, he did say there was a, a $50 million surplus in the education trust fund. He wants to take $30 million of that and give it to schools, but for the express purpose of um, helping with buildings and other things, which he actually, we, this came up in the last budget too, before we put the money to give to schools to do as they saw best fit um, to deal with at their school level. So, um, like I said, sort of short on details right now, just so folks understand the process. Like I said, HB1 is out now, HB2 will be out shortly. Once House Bill 2 comes out, you'll, we'll know more. It'll work its way through the Finance Committee in the House and then through the Finance Committee in the Senate. Uh, this will be a long haul for this bill. It'll be interesting uh, things to watch for and to follow. Um, it is possible he tries to take um, the voucher bill and put it into the budget. Um, that is something that could happen, especially if it passes uh, the House Education Committee. Um, so things, you know, we should watch out for that. Uh, you know, they can stick really whatever policy they want into that into that trailer bill. So um, this is not the full story yet. Um, we've seen strange things happen with the budget in the House a couple of years ago. The House didn't even pass one. Um, uh, didn't pass a version of their budget. So, um, you know, there's a long way to go in this. And um, Republicans were in control, by the way, the student who was governor um, and the Republicans were in control and couldn't pass a budget. So uh, weirder things have happened, but um, we're still waiting on a lot of details. That's sort of a very, very top line of where the governor's, what the governor said today. Thank you, Mike. That's, that, that's a good update. Um, I'm about to pass it uh, off to Mar uh, Mary and Louise for questions. But tend to glaze over when you start talking numbers and even I could follow these presentations um, and I really look forward to having the opportunity to study the PowerPoints um, and I just can't thank you enough for coming and helping us all have the background information we need so that we can effectively engage on these issues um, across the board. So, so thanks um, Jeff and Phil and Mike uh, really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, Mary, I think even though we said I was going to ask the first question, I think I'm going to turn it over to you because I think we want to go to Barbara Reed's question, which is kind of one of the big issues of the night. Mike touched on it, but I think we probably want to get a little more in depth there. Whoops. Are you there, Mary? I forgot to unmute. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> You'd think I'd know by now. <laughs> it's the old dog and new tricks problem. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I think uh, the question was really, um, can I, and Mike O'Brien mentioned this, but it, pretty quickly. Um, do we have a sense of how much money would be diverted uh, to private and, uh, and religious schools and home schools um, in the upcoming budget or if some of this new legislation goes through? So yeah. the, the analysis that AFT has done is shown that it's anywhere from like 87 to 90 ish million dollars. And the, the crux here for those who haven't followed HB 20 very closely is that you don't quite know um, because it's going to depend on how many people take advantage of the, of the money that's there. Right. But if everyone uh, took advantage of, H, of HB 20, if it were to pass as written and I mean, and almost every student in New Hampshire could and family in New Hampshire could, um, and if you just took the people who are currently in private schools or currently homeschooled, you would lose about another 87 to 95 million um, in um, adequacy aid from the state. So it's a, it's a big blow, uh, especially on top of the numbers that we're talking about already tonight. Thank you. Yeah, and I, one of the things that came out today with the testimony was, you know, the. The 20, what Senator Khan is putting in the, the chat that 22,000 students would automatically, who are already being homeschooled and, um, and or in private schools would be able to just claim money uh, that they hadn't had access to before. So um, it's not even students that are currently in the system leaving and then taking quote unquote you know, their, their ad funding with them, but it's that students who are already not in the system and now being able to go back in and claim dollars. So the impact there is gonna be huge. Um, so um, 
I just, I wanted to go back at the very beginning. Uh, we have uh, Andy Velinsky um, on the call and he'll be joining us at the next, um, at the March meeting. Uh, but as an executive counselor, uh, former executive counselor, he raised the issue about um, the role of the executive council and the joint fiscal committee. So the, there's the governor's budget, there's the legislature. Can anyone speak to that issue? Um, and, and Andy, if you wanna. Sure, I, and I, I can say that my description was incomplete. Yes, there are, there are um, when federal funds are accepted during the state budget biennium, um, the Joint Legislative Fiscal Committee is not the only venue uh, through which approval often has to pass, right? The Executive Council is one of those venues as well. And I, again, this is, this is a case, as, as Jeff pointed out at the beginning of his remarks that I alluded to in mine, there are people on the call who know more about the, of these items and know more of the details than, than we do in some cases. So um, I'm sure that you know, Councillor Velinsky would be, or former Councillor Velinsky would be able to uh, parse through what situations um, the federal fund acceptance is required. But yes, my description uh, of it, Joyce being just the Joint Legislative Fiscal Committee was was not uh, not certainly not complete for all situations. Right, and that was in no way um, to say that your answer wasn't complete, as to just point to how complicated this whole funding stream is, um, and that there are pieces that the public isn't familiar with that then come into play. So um, it's not surprising that you in your presentation couldn't cover every, every particular avenue. And it's why it's great on these, uh, we're always really fortunate to have such um, expertise join us on these um, meetings. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, Mary, I'll turn it over to you for the next question. Um, I didn't see any other questions, although there was a discussion about the um, about how restaurants and hotels can keep three percent of the tax they collect, which adds up to about ten million dollars in a good year, and maybe that's more than they really need to administer the tax. And I, this is all new to me. Would I don't know if somebody would like to speak to that? Maybe Phil, is that your is that yes, your I fault? Yeah, I, I can at least describe the the situation. This is where um, basically a portion of the revenue that would have gone to the state is kept by the um, by the people collecting the tax, right? The restaurants, the hotels, et cetera, um, be, as sort of payment for thank you for collecting this tax for us, and um, and then the rest of it goes to the state, but three percent, and that's not three that's not three of the nine percent rate that it is. I should say that's that's three percent of the payment, right? Um, that uh, so that's basically the um, I don't, I'm trying to remember if they use the word commission, but it's basically the payment that they get to keep for it. Um, there has been discussion of adjusting that. Um, in light of the pandemic, for example, to help uh, help restaurants. Um, and there's also been discussion prior to the COVID-19 crisis of, is that amount, uh, does that amount actually cover costs? Is it more than the cost? How does it compare to the costs of actually uh, collecting the meals and rentals tax at the, at the restaurant side um, and at the hotel side? And at, as Jeff pointed out, the rental car side, since that's the portion that goes to the Education Trust Fund. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Thank you. So um, I'm going to have Senator Khan unmute uh, because, again, in the spirit of these things are complicated and the whole that there are issues around the federal funding that comes into schools, uh, that it it would be helpful to have a little bit um, get your insights on that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Louise. I, I just don't want people to leave the conversation without acknowledging that the federal government and its relief packages is trying to offer assistance to public schools. Uh, the latest uh, round uh, in, that passed in December led to a $155 million addition to school funding in New Hampshire. Uh, the Department of Education has identified how much school districts would receive. It, it's all based on Title I uh, and the number of students that are served through the federal Title I program. 
that allocation is $140 million of the total $155 million that might be set aside for New Hampshire. Um, that is four times the amount that the ESSER elementary secondary relief uh, package provided in 21. This amount, four times the amount that your school districts might have gotten in the first round of ESSER, um, that amount is eligible to be spent any time. Uh, oh, we lost your sound, Senator. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, I just live in rural Keene. Mm. Uh, anyway, am I back? Yes. Oh, good. All right, so uh, those dollars from ESSER 2, uh, they can be spent through fiscal year 23. So uh, that, that amount, I mean, it's a big amount of money. Uh, and I just want you to know that, that and, and it, what it could do, it could help meet the CDC requirements for safe schools. For instance, uh, if schools have HVAC and ventilation problems in their school districts, which makes it unsafe to bring students back into schools. Big projects like that could be funded with these uh, one-time dollars. And they are one-time. So they're not addressing the long-term issues of how do we deal with student and taxpayer inequities per school funding formula. That is what Senate Bill 158 aims to do. Um, and the confusion that's gonna to continue to evolve is what do we do in the short term here? Uh, and I think uh, Jeff and Phil and Mike, they've all done a terrific job of giving us background as to why fiscal capacity aid is needed because there are disparities in districts and in towns. Uh, and we need to solve that in the short term and in the long term. We need to send a message to the, to the property poor, low property valuation towns that the state of New Hampshire is there to help support the education of their kids and help relieve the burden on their taxpayers. And Kent Street, you're doing a great job communicating that. Just want you to have a full deck when you go and and, and present your testimonies. Thank you. And that's um, a big part of what we're trying to do is get advocates familiar with the broad range of issues and um, some of the nuances so that we can be effective advocates. But also, um, as Renya points out, Renya Woods points out, Gary, Gary Woods is um, dear partner, wife, um, that there's, the issue of, of doing the advocacy and then the issue of how we message to the public and how we um, go from the details and the nuances to the clarity of message about, you know, the downshifting of costs and that it's a, you know, an unsustainable system. Um, and that's, we'll be talking more about that overall messaging at our meeting in March, um, just so people know this, this meeting was set up to help all of us really understand um, these nuances. And I really appreciate the, the clarification, Senator, and always welcome any information that you might send our way so that we are um, well informed as we're going in to advocate. Um, I appreciate that so much. So thank you. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Mary for another question. Um, there were a few more questions about homeschool and um, you know, voucher related questions. One is um, if a homeschooled student can still participate in public school activities, would any of the money from the state still go back to the public schools to support that? And um, there's also, um, well, maybe I should stop there. There, there are other questions about the estimates. We, I think, I think I can answer. The, I think I can answer this question, but some of you could point out if I'm not. You know, should the 
estimates be higher because there are kids who um, aren't in in public school, aren't in private school and homeschool now, but but might uh, jump that way. But my sense is that it's really hard to predict that at the moment. But let me go back to that first question, sorry, about um, would any money go back to public schools if a student was being homeschooled and was taking adequacy money that now this public school is not getting, um, but they go back to public school to take a class or to do after school activities or whatever. Uh, is that something that Mike, would, are you a good one to answer that? Sure, and Jeff, you might be able to correct me if I'm wrong here. My understanding of the bill is they define a student um, if they take less than 50% is the way it's defined in the bill right now of instruction um, at their school, um, then they can qualify for the EFA. Um, and so a student could take math. Um, if they only took that one math, it was less than 50% of their instruction. Um, they could certainly participate in sports the same way that um, they do now or extracurricular activities in the school would be left uh, sort of pick that up. Um, if there's someone, uh, I see a few members of the committee, if I'm not saying that correctly, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the way it works uh, as defined in the bill right now at the moment. Uh, it's just another one of those sort of problematic pieces. And just, just so I can follow up because I kind of garbled it before, but if, are there any other estimates about how many, how much this would cost once not just the new people jump in, but people who are currently in public school, but decide they'd really rather send their kid to parochial school. That we, don't, that we don't have an estimate on that. I'll say that, you know, we're using based on the 22,000 number that Senator Khan uh, mentioned. The other problem there is the amount of money from the state is anywhere from 3,700 to 80 something hundred. I'm forgetting exactly what the second number is, but so, um, it ranges, right? It's not. Yeah. It's not. It's not fully static. If it was thirty-seven hundred each, it would be really easy to say. But we're doing this just based on if every student, homeschool, private school, religious school, whatever it is, took that grant. That's how much it would cost the state. It could very well balloon much higher than that. Thank you. So, Mike, I'm. You may have said this, and and I might have just missed it as I was scrolling through. Um, but one of the most fundamental things I learned from Representative Mary Jane Wallner is this idea that a budget is a statement not only of, you know, spending, but of values and policy. And so in terms of what you heard from the governor today, um, apart from the numbers involved, was he... Uh, making certain values statements about where he was going with education in this state. Uh, so you're going to hear the governor say, I've heard him, his staff say it a few times, they've spent more money on, on education in this budget than any previous budget. Um, I'm a little confused how he gets there. I'm going to assume he's taking the disparity aid and somehow deciding it doesn't count because it wasn't in the trust fund. Maybe I, I don't really know what he's trying to pull there, but Based on what we see, we know it's going to be less. Um, I, you know, I, he didn't, surprisingly to me, he didn't talk about HB 20 or any of those other bills in the budget today. I thought he would. I thought, it. you know, they like to trumpet it. <clears throat> they like to trumpet choice. They didn't. Um, so honestly, Louise, the answer is not really other than to say, when you look at the numbers, you know that he didn't fund it as high as it was in the past. And so I think that's the that's the clearest statement that the governor could make today. If, if I could chime in there, um, just to echo a little bit of what Mike was saying, uh, it's clear he wants to portray himself as a friend of public education, talking about his bona fides, having attended public schools in New Hampshire. Um, but, you know, as you said, a budget is a statement of your priorities. And if you're not putting the money towards that, um, what kind of priority is it really? Um, one other sort of figure in addition to sort of claim about spending more on public education than any prior budget. Folks may have seen um, that he was touting spending $13,000, $13,300 per student. Um, I look forward to hearing his budget director explain how that number was derived. Um, since if you look at adequacy aid on a per pupil basis, it averages about $5,800. Um, would that it were that um, the state were providing $13,000 in adequacy aid for every kid in the state. Great. Um, I'm wondering if, if um, 
Representative Walner is here with us. If you had any uh, comment that you might want to make, you've been such a champion of education funding, and no one knows more about uh, the budget process than you. You are. Are you able to unmute and share a few thoughts? Uh, let's see. Hi. Can you hear me? Oh yes, we can. Hi. Hi, Louise. Representative. Hi. I, I was just making my I was just making dinner, so I was over on the other side. But um, yeah, I mean, budget budget addresses always make things seem. I mean, of course, you always dress them up, and they don't really tell you any of the details. So the next few weeks, we're really going to dig into the details in the finance committee and really try to understand what is in this budget and what isn't in this budget. But it, it does appear with um, the tax reductions, um, it really does appear that there will be a lot of downshifting in this budget. Um, I'm concerned about um, the county, the county share. He said nothing about that today, but I'm, I'm, I fear that that will, the county share will probably go up the county share of costs. Um, shifting costs down to the municipalities, not sending, not sending back the same level of aid that we've had in the past. Um, I think will the taxes that will increase. I think will be the property property taxes. Um, so we'll. It, there's a lot to learn about the budget. There always is. It was 1,300 pages. So and um, we don't have House Bill two yet, and that's where the that's where a lot of a lot of things happen in House Bill 2 that um, make a lot of changes. So it'll be a busy next few weeks, but I'm hoping everybody will be contacting their legislators. And if you live in a district that has a member on the finance committee, please be sure to get in touch with them as soon as possible and start talking to them about the budget. So thank you, Louise. Thank, thank you, you Kent Street. Thank you. And I also want to acknowledge um, that Mel Myler, Representative Mel Myler, and uh, Dave Luna was on, but it's his wife's birthday, so he wasn't able to stay. But, you know, we're instrumental in the, the Commission on Funding Public Education. And there's, there's a lot to unpack there, a lot that we can explore. And we want to thank them for that amazing work that they did. Um, and um, it, it was, it's more in depth than what we could cover tonight, but it, it's really important and significant contribution to, to the, the values and priorities. And so um, we look forward to hearing more about that. I also see that there are lots and lots of questions about HB 20. Um, and I know there's also another school voucher bill um, we, we won't have time to get to all of those questions, uh, but we'll try to find a way to um, go more in depth on those issues. Mary Wilkie keeps us posted um, on a lot of that information. We do get, um, we put out as much of that as we can in terms of talking points and other background information. I just wanna make people aware that uh, we have a weekly newsletter uh, that we've started up again with the legislative session called Kent Street Happenings. It goes out Sunday, um, hopefully Sunday late afternoon, but probably more realistically Sunday evening. Um, and contained in there will be all the education bills that we're following, uh, the budget information, um, and the other priority bills of our, of our working groups. And we have a wide array of uh, working groups. We work very closely with Mike on voting rights and redistricting, um, and there are important bills there as well. So if you're interested in um, joining our mailing list and getting that legislative update each week, uh, we invite you to do that. Um, and so I guess we're, we're up on eight o'clock, there were a lot of questions we weren't able to get to. Uh, if you, um, you can email us and we can direct them. If you 
say who you were going to ask them of, or if it's a general question, let us know and we can try to uh, connect you with some answers on that. Um, Mary, I, I guess I'd like to give you and then Rob the final word uh, because Mary Wilkie um, for Kent Street has been our, just our North Star, um, guiding star, load star, what's the right term? I don't but know. When it comes to education, mm -hmm. um, really helping us to navigate um, issues around school funding and now her work with the School Funding Fairness Project with, with Jeff's organization and um, you know, working with John Tobin and Andrew, Val Councillor Valinsky. Um, so, but I, Mary is just a tremendous advocate for children and education. So I, I wanna thank you and acknowledge you for that. And um, if you have any few words that you wanna say, and then I'll let Rob wrap it up. Well, thank you, that was very nice. Um, I'd just like to thank the presenters because honestly, I, um, this is so complicated and I've been trying to understand school funding for three years and there's always something I still don't get. And you guys filled in a few more of those for me tonight. So I really appreciate that. And I'm sure you did for a lot of other people here as well. So thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Th um, I, I, the only thing I will say is, is we, I mentioned in the beginning that um, there is, we're probably good, we're trying to put together some sort of a forum on the voucher bill so we can directly spend some time working on that and the other educational bills that are in the House and the Senate. Um, the uh, NEA and civics are, have launched a project um, together, uh, which uh, is just getting off the ground that will include postcards and calling people up and all the good things that Kent Street is uh, interested in doing. And my guess is that uh, we will be calling upon you over the next few weeks um, to work on that. And you guys will have an opportunity to specifically do stuff about the voucher bill. Um, and we'll have a forum about that. I think uh, I don't probably want to settle down and let, let what's in the bills become a little clearer um, and let the budget, uh, Mary Jane can tell us all about how the budget shakes out. And I think she said she's going to figure it all out in the next 10 days or so. Um, so we've got a lot of stuff on our plate. I think that what uh, the message we're trying to send to you tonight is that education is a real issue uh, with their associated uh, uh, slide decks from our panelists. And thanks very much to them. Uh, this has been a really good evening. Uh, I think we've all learned a lot. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Oh, and thank you, Rob Claflin, for putting it all together, yes. as always. Thank you. Thank you so much.